All right, let's try that again. All right, so we're going to talk about the alveoli now, these little grape-like structures at the end of our bronchioles. The alveoli are where gas exchange occurs, okay? So important to know about the alveoli, they are surrounded with capillaries. And we're going to exchange gas between the alveoli and the bloodstream. So oxygen is going to leave the alveoli, go into the blood, and then carbon dioxide, which is that waste product that we make in glycolysis and Krebs, all that kind of stuff, uh, that's going to leave the blood and go into the lungs so we can exhale. Now one other thing I want you to just notice, we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but I want you to take notice to the fact that there is also a whole lot of elastic connective tissue surrounding each individual alveoli. So that's going to be a little bit uh, later on, that's going to be very important about what we're talking about. But for now, okay, so let's say that um, this is our single alveoli, okay? And then we have capillaries surrounding these alveoli. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw them in two different colors. And these colors are going to represent how much oxygen is going to be found in the blood. So if it's blue, this is going to have less oxygen in the blood. If it's red, it's going to have more oxygen. So typically, if our red blood cells are low in oxygen, it's our deoxygenated blood, we would say this is the venous side of the capillary. And then this would be the arterial side because now the blood is actually oxygenated. So this blood that's coming through here, this is coming from the right side of the heart. And then once it picks up its supply of oxygen and then dumps off its carbon dioxide load, this blood is then going to the left atrium. Now oxygen and carbon dioxide, as they are leaving and entering this alveoli, they're just moving by simple diffusion. So oxygen moves from simple diffusion from the alveoli to the blood, and CO2 simple diffusion from the blood to the alveoli. Now there is a space right here in between our alveoli and our capillary. It's a very small space. I make it look like it's huge, but it's a very, very small space. It's probably only about 10 angstroms between the alveoli to the capillary. Now, we've talked about angstroms before. So you know angstroms really, really tiny. So these guys, these capillaries, are just about touching the alveoli. This space in between the alveoli and the capillary is typically referred to as the alveolar space. That space can't be too big. It has to be really, really small because you don't want a big distance between the capillary and the alveoli because oxygen and CO2 can't travel too far. And so you've got to have these guys right next to each other. Also, there's a little tiny bit, tiny, tiny bit of liquid in this space. That's okay. Oxygen and CO2 can travel through that liquid. But what if we have a patient who, let's say, has pneumonia? And now they're building up fluid in their lungs. And some of this fluid is sticky fluid because we've got bacteria building up in there and white blood cells trying to fight it. And we make a lot of mucus in there. And we get this sticky fluid that seeps into this alveolar space. And what it does is it starts pushing the alveoli and the capillaries away from each other. Far enough that oxygen and CO2 can't diffuse in and out of the lungs and the blood. 
and now your patient dies from not being able to exchange gases. So that buildup of fluid in that alveolar space, big, big problem. Also, if we look at the wall of the alveoli, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, April, first. I just want to know, is that also one of the respiratory space? Yes, oh. yes, so it could be alveolar space, it could be respiratory space. Depends on who you're talking to or where you're reading. So yes, thank you, good question. Okay, so the wall of the alveoli are alveolar or respiratory space, and then the wall of the capillary. These three things, wall of the alveoli, our space, and then the wall of the capillary. All three of these together are referred to as the respiratory membrane. So again, wall of the alveoli, the space in between, wall of the capillary. The, this is the respiratory membrane. And all three of them have to be perfectly healthy. All three of them have to be functioning right, or all three of them have to be intact in order for good respiration to take place. So let's say we have a person who is um, smoking a lot of cigarettes over a long period of time. Don't ask me how much a lot or how long it is. It has to do with what they're smoking and their genetics, all that kind of stuff. But they're smoking a lot of cigarettes for many, many years and they're paralyzing their cilia continuously. And as they're paralyzing their cilia, stuff is going down into the lungs, into the alveoli. And it's the debris and it's mucus. Eventually, if we keep paralyzing our cilia, eventually they will die. Now you know, you can tell when somebody's cilia has died because they get that smoker's cough, you know, that cough where they sound like they're hacking up a lung, okay, they're coughing so hard. That's because all this garbage is now getting down into the lungs and you can't stop it. Nothing comes back up. What will eventually happen is as, remember now, our alveoli are thinner than tissue paper and you start building up this extra mucus and all this other dust and particles in there, what would happen to tissue paper if you put all that stuff on top of it? It would tear, it disintegrate. So is the wall of the alveoli. And eventually this wall has the potential to disintegrate. Now, if oxygen comes in, so oxygen moves in, it is so far away from the blood that instead of getting into the blood, it just sort of diffuses out in any direction and the person can't pick it up in the bloodstream. And so you don't get diffusion in. So that wall of that alveoli has to remain intact for us to be able to get oxygen in and out of the system. We also have to make sure that this little respiratory space, our alveolar space is very small, don't accumulate any fluid or mucus in there or you can't exchange gases. And if you have any kind of block or damage to the capillary, you won't be able to exchange gases. So when they say the resting membrane has to be, or respiratory membrane has to be intact, that means the wall of the alveoli, the space, and the capillary all have to be working perfectly or you can't exchange gases. This is a problem. And breaking down that alveolar wall is pretty easy to do if we keep sending all kinds of junk down into the lungs. Now, by the way, all of us, okay, are going to lose some alveoli as we get older. It just, it's hap it happens, it's natural. All of us, to some extent, as we get older, <coughs> will have a little bit of what we call emphysema, which is losing the alveoli. You're destroying the walls of the alveoli. Everybody gets it. You just won't be super sick from it like other people will. They will get it much worse. You'll just have a few alveoli that you, you lose, not a whole bunch. But here's my advice to you, okay? If anything else you've ever heard in your life, any kind of advice, this is more important advice than any of it, okay? So listen close. Don't get old, it sucks. <laughs> okay, so stop right now, don't do it, done, okay? I'm, I'm telling you, it's the best advice you'll ever get. So 
So what about people that quit smoking? Is there a chance to rebuild that? Ah, good question. Yes and no. Uh, even if you have a person who's been smoking for, let's say, 30, 40 years, okay? When they quit, they will stop building up all that nasty mucus and particles in their lungs. Some of it will be able to be cleaned out over time. And within the first, like, say, six months of them stopping smoking, they will tell you that they feel better. Now, will they ever be totally okay again? No. But can it get better? Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> can alveoli rebuild? No. So I quit smoking like four or five years ago, or four years ago. My lungs will never come back to 100%, huh? No, but neither will any of ours. The rest of us in here don't have 100% either. We're alive. Everybody's lungs deteriorates over time. Everybody's. So the fact that you stopped uh, I'm sure you feel a lot better as far as breathing, and so your lungs have healed to some extent. Will they ever be as perfect as when you were 10? No. I got really sick right after I quit smoking. Oh, very, very common. Very common. Yeah, because <laughs> your whole body tries to compensate around the smoking, and then when you take that all away, now it's got to figure out how to get back to normal homeostasis again. So super common. Yeah. The immune system's all messed up and yeah. And you know, if you're quitting smoking, if you can get through the first two weeks, you'll make it. But it's those first two weeks that are just they're gonna kill you and you're gonna kill somebody else. You know, it's just it's that kind of thing. Now, inside the alveoli, there are a couple other cells that are helping us out. One of those cells, I think this is kind of an interesting thing, we call them dust cells. That's their actual official name. But these are just phagocytes. And so in case stuff does get into our lungs and we haven't been able to catch it all, here's another mechanism to keep us from, you know, getting this emphysema. We've got all these little dust cells cruising around eating up all the dirt. Their job is to like vacuum up the inside of those alveoli, which is really nice. Other type of cell that we have inside the alveoli is called a type two cell, okay? Type two cells secrete a very important chemical. This chemical is surfactant. The job of surfactant is to decrease surface tension in the alveoli. Okay, so now I'm gonna take you back to the first weeks of school. In those first weeks, we talked about surface tension. So do you remember when we talked about those two glass slides and you put a little bit of water in between those two glass slides and those two glass slides can stick together and you can't break them apart very easily because of surface tension. And then I told you on the inside of our alveoli, we have proteins that like our glass slides create a negative charge. You remember this? And then inside, because we're humidifying the air that we breathe, we're bringing water with our air into our lungs, you bring this water in and it has the slightly positive, slightly negative thing going on and the water can bind to the walls. And what this water can do is grab a hold of the walls of the alveoli and suck those walls in, cause that alveoli to implode. And it sucks it in so tight that no matter how deep you breathe, you can't blow this back up. Once it gets sucked in, that's it. You and I don't have the ability to blow it back up. But now, obviously, we don't have any problem with our alveoli because we were born making surfactant. And what surfactant does is it's an oil that coats the walls of the alveoli, covering over all the negative charges, preventing the water from binding. And so when water gets into our alveoli, just like if you drop water on the oil in your cooking pan, it just sort of balls up. The water balls up around the edge of the alveoli and then, we exhale that water 
and now our alveoli won't implode. But sometimes babies are born premature. And type 2 cells cannot start <coughs> making surfactant until around the eighth month of pregnancy. And the reason is that type 2 cells require a certain hormone to stimulate them in order to get these cells mature enough to start making surfactant. Now that hormone, you are well aware of, this hormone is cortisol. And a fetus doesn't really make much cortisol until around the eighth month of pregnancy. And you don't want a fetus to be making a lot of cortisol until then because cortisol can be catabolic. So you got this little baby that's trying to build and you don't want a hormone that potentially can tear things down. This is also why you don't want mom to be super stressed while she's pregnant, okay? Because if mom is super stressed while she's pregnant, she's producing lots of cortisol, which is a steroid hormone that goes right through the uterus, right into baby's blood, and now baby has as high stress levels as mom does. And that cortisol goes into baby and makes all kinds of changes prematurely in that child, and those babies can be born with some problems the problems that cortisol produces, an immune system problem, and we can go all those problems that you had to list for cortisol being too high. Babies can be born with all those problems if mom is stressed out. This can also potentially happen if baby's gonna be born premature. So for instance, um, it's pretty well known that if a mom has one premature baby, uh, there's a high probability she'll have another. Now, it's not 100%. Uh, but you got to be aware that it's a possibility. So mom has one preemie, so what you're going to do is make sure that this preemie doesn't, um, when it's born early, doesn't have any respiratory problems. And so what you're going to do is start injecting mom around the fourth month of pregnancy. You're going to start injecting her with cortisol. Mom's going to come in once a month, and you're going to give her cortisol injections. And then around the eighth month, you're going to bring her in every couple weeks and give her cortisol injections. Which also means that you are causing type 2 cells to mature early so that the type 2 cells can make surfactant early so that when the baby's born early, they won't have any respiratory problems. And the alveoli will open up when they take their first breath instead of get stuck together. It's the number one cause of uh, premature death when those babies are born early that their alveoli are stuck together. Uh, you'll try in the hospital to put tubes down the baby's throat and drip surfactant in there, hoping you'll pop some alveoli open. Sometimes it works. Most of the time it doesn't. Um, babies born early, this will be the number one cause of their death. Uh, and so what you want to do is if you give cortisol to mom early, baby will make surfactant early. And baby will not have respiratory distress when they're born. But because you've given baby such a high level of cortisol, they may have other problems. They're gonna be really cranky. They may have uh, a lifetime of immune system problems. Uh, they may have other deficiencies because cortisol was so high. Of course, a lot of people say, well, then why do we do that? Well, if you don't do that, baby dies. If you do it, baby lives, but baby's gonna have some problems. They're not gonna be like mentally retarded, but they may get sick easier, okay? or they may have more ear infections than they normally would, or they may later on develop an autoimmune disease, or you know, we don't know what's gonna happen, but the baby's gonna live, you know, and, and live a, a normal life, but just probably have to be a little careful. Now the problem is, most of the time, when we do this and give these cortisol injections, we don't explain to the parents, your baby may be a little crankier than most, because they're not exactly the healthiest child coming out and parents aren't exactly totally prepared. I'm not sure a lot of doctors are totally prepared and realize what all these high levels of cortisol potentially could do to this child, especially in the short term and the long term. So yeah, if, when you have a mom come in and say, my baby's crying all the time, she seems so stressed out. Well, probably because all her life she's going to be very easily stressed because she's had these high levels of cortisol. Now she's super sensitive to stress. So little things like that will just you know, help the parents along the way to be a little more wise 
in how to be able to deal with their child. So important for you to know that too.